Our speaker today is Shmuel Weinberger from University of Chicago, who will share with us some musings on robotic football. Okay, all right. Oh. <coughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, a topological complexity. I mean, right, there's this whole wonderful seminar. There are lots and lots of people working on it. And of course, it is a very precise mathematical um, paradigm, right? That, but it grew out of thinking about the motion of robots, okay? I mean, uh, you know, the robots became abstracted to become points, uh, you know, their motions and were, you know, you know, all of the movements became topological spaces and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I mean, there is sort of an elegant and deep mathematical theorems in, you know, in this field. Um, but I decided to go back to the beginnings and its motivations uh, because I think that there are, you know, a set of other problems that, you know, I mean, I can't be sure about what their level of depth is going to be, you know, I mean, until we actually do the explorations, but I don't want, I, I just want to encourage uh, thinking more generally about what it is that the problems that robots have to confront um, in, you know, in something like a real world. I mean, I have to admit that um, I, you know, well, I, I don't know what I know about the real world I, uh, or whether I actually even live in one, but uh, I just, you know, so I'm going, going back to the armchair, okay, rather than going back to the blackboard. Okay, so what I want to talk about football is because a, uh, by chance, the, you know, the one theorem that I'm going to prove today, the one, you know, maybe somewhat novel theorem, um, I did prove on Super Bowl Sunday, and I've been trying to do it for a bit before then. Uh, and so here is, here's the problem. Um, and football is sufficiently general to include both American football and soccer. Um, I went to the wiki page about on football and there are many variants and I'm not sure whether, I'm not gonna give a precise definition of football because I don't know that it would embrace uh, all of the possibilities. Um, but in, in any case, you know, in, in football, uh, one situation is, you know, you might have a receiver who is in this picture, a red dot, okay? And, um, and there are blockers, which are those, you know, uh, you know, those other uh, dots. At the moment, I'm picking a very, very idealized form, you know, where the blockers don't really get to move all over the field. Okay, and um, I'll, uh, for those in the know, you know, which I presume is the whole audience and not me, uh, you know, a, for lots of situations, say when you study configuration spaces, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, uh, upper bounds of complexity exists by finding decompositions of a certain size. In order to get the lower bound, very often they're realized in very, very special configurations, right? I mean, you know, sort of like, you know, sets of solar systems defining cycles in uh, configure in, you know, in, you know, in the braid group and configuration space of points in the plane. So in this case, uh, the obstructions uh, that occur in, you know, in football are well. In all football, you know, the obstruction is part is the blockers, uh, but we'll already be seeing them when the block, you know, where each blocker is assigned to live in some strip, um, and it goes back and forth in various places. And now the job in this really, really idealized form of football is to get a, a red dot on, uh, you know, from one side of the field to the other. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, so yeah. So I have on the other side um, the goal or. Or a field goal, or you know, or it could be that thing could be the whole interval if you're trying to get a touchdown. Okay, um, so and then you know, like in usual topological complexity, this measures something, and what we're measuring is the amount of instability. Um, you know, based on the initial configurations of the football players, uh, just how complex is the planning problem uh, at the moment? Uh, that the that the robot or the football player uh, has to make. Uh, when I talk about robots, they do not have to be made out of metal. They could be, you know, uh, meat robots uh, like uh, you and me. Okay, so that's going to be the problem. It doesn't fit into the usual framework. I mean, it's a very very mild problem. It doesn't fit into the usual framework because uh, the problem is a little bit different depending on where the blockers are. 
Uh, and of course, at any play, if the blockers are not on the sidelines at the exact edge of the field, then of course it seems like the usual kind of configuration space of points that don't, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's pretty boring. I mean, you know, I mean, they're just points that don't intersect each other. However, when you sit at the end point, when it, one of the things is that is on the sideline, then the complements topology changes. And that means that something or other is not a vibration. Okay. So I want to point out that even this, so, from one point of view, in the usual paradigm that you think about, you're trying to find a bunch of sections, and I'll, you know, return to that, you know, how we get to that paradigm in, in a minute. But you're right, you're looking for sections of various kinds, and then you'd say, well, this configuration space, well, you rigged it. I mean, it's just so stupid. It's got to be a trivial problem. You know, you you have um, a, um, oh, one second. Okay, you have a zero one to the k, which is, you know how up and down the decay the blockers could be. And then you maybe have some epsilon because I gave it a, a little bit of a strip. The epsilon doesn't really matter to a topology. Then no, neither does the other direction, right? You know, that zero one to the K, that's contractible. We're all used to everything being trivial when you're contractible, okay? So that's in fact another reason why I do this. I'm not asserting that this is universal, even though this is, um, this problem, though, is a very, I feel, natural problem, uh, at least on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, where you have a contractible configuration, you have a contractible parameter space, okay? But uh, we will see that this is indeed obstructive, okay? That, you know, the robot, the, the, the quarterback, I guess, you know, cannot just look at, you know, look at the, uh, the thing and if there would be some small errors, expect that a small perturbation of his initial decision, you know, will, dis will describe the route he should be taking in going down the field, okay? Right, so that there are in instabilities and there's some number of instabilities, et cetera, okay? So it's a very, you know, so I, this, this, this problem is exactly the sort that when, that you study in normal topological complexity, it just has, you know, it has a strange feature that the underlying topological space is contractible. But on the other hand, the work map, the map that goes from the parameter space to the problems that you're trying to solve um, are not contractible. I mean, it's not a vibration. And that's why contractible could uh, result in there being uh, difficulties. Okay. Okay. So that's the problem. Okay. I, I want to, you know, truth in advertising, I want to just start off and tell you the problem at first. Uh, but uh, my, so, but this is the outline of the talk and uh, football is, you know, the, I, I'll hope to at the, you know, number four mark in, you know, right. I mean, in, in the motion planning of this talk, uh, you know, football will be item number four. Okay. So what I would like to do is start off, uh, you know, with the prehistory of this subject, which is the work that Steve Smale did um, on the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, not his positive results, where he actually found algorithms that, you know, converge on a set of full measure, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk about his earlier topological work that motivated this community uh, and talk about where there's a role for singularities there, um, you know, uh, to again, uh, try to push for the idea of consider continuing uh, singularities. Then I'll discuss uh, Michael Farber's definition of topological complexity. I presume I could be pretty short uh, with this crowd, uh, and then discuss sort of my, the instinct that propels uh, this, uh, this work, uh, which is uh, trying to take into account the resources, the, the problems that are actually confronted by robots and the resources available to them, okay? Uh, so uh, in Michael's version, you know, uh, the the problem is you you know that the robot has to deal with the flexibility that every day he's given a different starting point and a different ending point right so that's why you have some an x cross x where x is an underlying space but in other situations like in this one it's the blockers it's the position of the blockers that changes every day every day he starts off you know in his end zone and he's trying to end up in the other end zone okay and it's the position of the blockers. Okay, so that's sort of a different problem, but there are other kinds of issues about resources, um, like uh, the robot might have to sense the environment. Okay, he, he might not get the environment directly, or they might be 
uh, you know, multiple robots and they need to communicate with each other and so on and so forth. And as we begin, you know, and that will be going on uh, hopefully towards the end of the talk where I talk about how other resources lead to other kinds of math problems that I think would be, you know, sort of uh, some of which I think would be in the expertise of this community. I mean, I think that there, some of them are new problems. There are lots of problems that involve under, you know, that involve indirectly configuration spaces or configuration spaces labeled by other kinds of data uh, in complicated ways. And, you know, I think that, you know, there are mysteries and, you know, I probably could go on forever because, you know, as I go on, I'm moving further into the unknown and the unknown is much, much greater than, than the known. Okay, so anyway, so this is my goals for the talk. Uh, but, you know, uh, unlike, you know, this robotic football where, you know, we assume that the robot achieves his goal, there's no reason to believe that I will achieve my goals. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So this is the seminal uh, paper um, of Steve Smale. And <coughs> okay. so um, again, let me just start off with a caricature of it. Okay, uh, which is I want to look at right. So he's interested in the following question. Uh, here you have the space of polynomials. P D. This is equal to the space of polynomials of degree equal to D. Okay, and what he wanted to know is the fundamental theorem of algebra says that well for every polynomial for every P in P D of z, right, uh, every p of z in pd, okay, uh, you know, there exists a root, okay? Now people use, let's, let's, by the way, let's be, a little, and, and so what Steve said, asked was, how hard is it to compute a root? Okay, okay. So what he then does is he said, okay, so here we have PD, over here we have, okay, so now you see, by the way, I mean, if you were a math, you know, I mean, if you were just a straight topologist, okay, you know, without thinking, I would have said, how hard is it to compute all the roots, right? Because isn't that a harder problem? And then I'd say, well, all the roots, the roots don't come with a natural ordering. So I will think there are D of them, right? And I'll even count them with multiplicity so that I'll, if something comes up twice, I'll put it down. And then I'd say, well, and then I should think about the answer as being in C to the D over the symmetric group on D letters. Okay, and right, and I would say that should be my computational problem, right? If you're gonna be thinking, you know, really canonically, you know, you know, as Grotendieck or Bourbaki would tell you to do. Um, but the trouble is that when you think about this, actually the fundamental theorem of algebra asserts that this is diffeomorphic to C to the D. And because how do you encode D, encode D different uh, roots up to isomorphic, you know, up to not caring about the order? Well, you encode it by the symmetric polynomials, which are exactly the coefficients of the polynomial. And then the map from PD to CD is the identity map. And surely that's not your computational problem, okay? If you were trying to encode your computational problem by saying, oh, finding one root is easier than finding D, and then that finding D, I have to do it, you know, I can't break the ordering, you know, then you've exactly defined away the problem. You've made this trivial and alas, much beautiful mathematics would be lost. Uh, but you instead think, I'm gonna think like a robot or like a computer or something like that. And I have to output the D roots in some order, okay? You know, so therefore, you know, I, you know, I'm really, I don't get to divide out by the symmetric group. And then you realize, oh, well, then I'm asking for something incredibly stupid, right? Then I'm asking for, I'm having, I'm asking how many ways are there of taking D unordered points and ordering them? Well, of course, there are de factorial ways, but I'm asking to do it in a continuous way. Okay. And now that, of course, we know can't be done. And the way Steve estimates, um, I, yeah, I'll add. 
electronic paper is cheap. So I'll add another page, right? So what of course he does, as we all know, is that he looks at P minus a discriminant locus. Okay, and he goes from this down to the configuration space. Essentially, it's the configuration space of D unequal points in the complex numbers. Okay, and um, right, so in this thing here, well, I mean, this you're thinking of as being C to the D minus a discriminant, right? I mean, by, in, in coefficient space. And what he's basically doing is asking for how, how much discontinuity must there be in a section, okay? And again, just to take a theme that we look at all the time, if we're looking at just a set, if you just look at the polynomials in P2, right, that consists of Z squared minus U, where U you are on the circle, or U is on the circle. I always find it hard when the variable is a U to know how to, uh, what verbs to use. But anyway, right, so as you go around the circle here, you're finding the square root. And of course, we all know, oh, yeah, the square root is a multi-valued function. You can't have a continuous branch. You have to break it somewhere. And then, of course, Smale's analysis could be done with very, very specific sets of polynomials. Uh, but then he says that, uh, what we call the Schwartz genus of this vibration, or if you, or, or maybe a little bit less, right? That those things there are very related. Um, you know, you could estimate those in terms of the de uh, degree, and as the degree goes up, the complexity goes up, as it should. Okay. Uh, so this was a, a very uh, uh, attractive result. Um, but you know, um, what about odd, what about real polynomials? Well, for one thing is, you know, real polynomials don't necessarily have roots and that might make you unhappy, okay? Um, and by the way, there are algorithms for this, I mean, but the algorithm, right? I mean, that's, uh, I, mean, I mean, for this problem, it goes back to Sturm in the 19th century, um, you know, in general for many, you know, for families with you know, many variables, there's Tarski's theorem. Uh, if you write in, I, I should have copied a, a flow chart for what the algorithm looked like. It has a lot of forking in it, okay? Um, and, you know, and forking is exactly this issue of discontinuity. That was Steve's point of view, that the forking in a computer program and the number of different forks that you visit as you uh, apply different inputs, that's essentially the topological complexity for Steve. Uh, Steve, by the way, refers to Smale here. Uh, I'm uh, choosing to be familiar. Now, for real polynomials, you might have, a, you know, say, suppose that you're odd degree so that you know there's a root. I mean, that's not going to make much of a difference. Okay. Now, you might feel that, well, uh, Shmuel, you set us up. You explained that the source of Steve's phenomenon was that you're having unordered, you know, you're, you're having something unordered and then you're insisting on an order and that, you know, that's what's not kosher. Okay. Um, but for real numbers, if I have a finite set of real numbers, I don't have to order them because the real numbers are ordered, right? So it, it feels like a very, very different kind of question. And of course, mathematically, it, it really is a different question. Uh, but I just want to point out, I mean, uh, there are these famous polynomials, the Chebyshev polynomials. So they're beautiful polynomials. So again, I, I, I just want to throw out some beautiful things because um, why not? So it's cosine of D times cosine inverse of X. Okay, this is a polynomial in X. Okay, um, it's a degree D polynomial. Uh, it has lots and lots of beautiful features on the interval minus one, one. It oscillates between minus one and one. Okay, I'm, uh, okay. And then, it, you know, I mean, it does what it does depending on whether your degree is, you know, odd or, or even. Okay. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I, you know, one could talk endlessly about Chebyshev polynomials. I shan't, okay, but I'm going to take them and I'm going to add one so that all, so that now they have lots and lots of roots at zero. All of their roots are in the interval minus one, one. And now what happens when I add on epsilon times X minus a root squared? Okay. 
right? I'm just going to add on some tiny little perturbation about that. Epsilon is arbitrarily tiny. So you know what happens. I mean, it's, you know, you don't have to be an analyst to do this calculation, right? Uh, whichever route you chose survives, the other routes get perturbed, you know, perturbed away, okay? Uh, and, and let me not worry about, you know, the, the big route, uh, you know, this one down there. Um, you know, so it's, it's a little better to do the even, the even degree case for the point I'm trying to make. But so there's a singular point, namely Chebyshev plus one. It's a specific point in the space of real uh, polynomials. Okay, for that point, if I asked you which route, you obviously could choose any one you want. But if I perturb the polynomial, if I perturb my point slightly, I could then be sent to any other route. Right, singularities plus continuity tells me that I'm forced by a different mechanism than Smale's mechanism, that there's going to be a topological complexity for root finding even in the real case. Okay, so I wanna, you know, so I guess my point is that football is something that comes up in topological robotics, but studying these kinds of, you know, I mean, if you really wanna take seriously the core problems that, you know, where, um, you know, sectional, category is a measure of the complexity of an algorithmic problem, okay, then, you know, you're, you know, very often ignoring the singularities throws you away from the phenomena that you're trying to catch, okay? We've been lucky in some of the robotic situations that, you know, and Smale was lucky by going to complex polynomials instead of real polynomials, okay? I mean, nah, I mean you know, when it happens once, it's luck when you do it, you know, two, three times every decade, then it's something more than that. But anyway, right, I mean, it, it looks like luck, you know, that you're able to get these results by ignoring the singularities, but there are things to be learned even in very, very simple cases uh, by going to the singularities, okay? Uh, so the next uh, stage in our story, which I'll be very brief on given what seminar this is, is uh, Michael Farber's work. This is uh, his seminal paper uh, that appeared in DCG where he defined the notion of topological complexity. And he had then imagined, you know, what we described, right? They have a, a robot that's living in a, in, a top, in a space called X. The robot is just a point. It has one job in life, which is to move from one place to another. It knows everything there is to know about the space X, okay? It's a very, very smart robot. It has, you know, it has amazing, uh, you know, it, it's a point, which means that it doesn't get stuck in, you know, trying to get through things. Uh, you know, I mean, we'll see, the, you know, uh, Farber's robots really have, you know, uh, superpowers, okay? Uh, and it, they have infinite computational powers. They can do anything, you know, that's continuous, okay? Um, and continuity, by the way, makes a lot of sense from the sensing point of view. But then he was asking how, uh, there are a few different versions of what you could ask his question. Uh, how much instability is there? You know, that if you have nearby endpoints, you'd be forced to take far paths that uh, differ from each other significantly, right? So that's this, or you could ask, if you were going to do this um, in a, uh, by randomized methods, how much, you know, how many different alternatives do you have to give um, a generic point? Would you have to give a, a point generically to be choosing among? I mean, there are a number of different interpretations. They all boil down to the same topological model. And I'm not complaining about the model. I mean, I think it's a good attempt for, you know, it tells you that even omnipotent, omnipotent robots, uh, you know, have, you know, there are just some things they can't do, okay? And um, yeah, good. Um, you see, I have this little note here that says graphs. And they're sort of, yeah, so when this robot is on a graph, Right, so you're given two points in a graph. So we know the topology of graphs. So firstly, you know, again, to a computer scientist, this feels really weird because of course different graphs, the problem really is different. The amount of computational resources you would have, even if they were trees would not be trivial, okay? That's kind of the issue that I raised in, in football about the parameter space being contractible and there still being problems. Uh, but then there's sort of another feature, right? So we know the homotopy type is just always a wedge of circles. And the answer is if it's no circles, if it's a point, there's no problem. If there's one circle, there's gonna be uh, one discontinuity. And if there are two or more circles, right, the complexity goes up one more time, okay? And that's it. And this to any, uh, you know, to anyone who's designing problems, you know, designing robots, et cetera, feels very, very counterintuitive, 
right? How could it be that no matter how complex the graph is, you know, in real terms, the complexity is unchanging? And of course, it's a theorem of mathematics, and you know, one can't, you know, it is what it is. And you could, you know, gloat and say, yes, we told you something unobvious that you don't know, right? Um, or you could try to figure out where is it that you know we're being defeated with the practice, okay? Uh, so, and the answer to both of those are, of course, the same, okay? Um, and that's. Uh, Oh, uh, well, this is um, a different point. I'm here, I'm telling you that you, I, I'm trying to focus you towards thinking about the fact that it's a changing environment. That's the first, the first thing that I'd like to call your attention to, right? You see, the point is that when computer scientists say that solving a problem is difficult on a, on a graph that's a complicated graph, what they typically mean is you don't know the complicated graph in advance. It's a different graph each time. If you're given the graph once and for all, and you're allowed to hardwire it into your robot, that it doesn't have to make any decision other than go from point X to point Y, then yes, that's what Michael's theory says, that you know, it is more complex when it's, you know, when, it's a, when it's a cycle than a tree. But when it becomes two cycles or three cycles, if you're will, you know, that's just some kind of initial, your initial overhead doesn't, go, you know, goes up. Okay. However, you know, after you know, if you're willing to make your ro your robots have, you know, give them more initial overhead, and you give them the same kind of task every single day, then they'll be able to go ahead and and do it without any additional uh, instability. Okay. Um, okay. However, what we're interested in, and you know, if you have a Roomba, it doesn't go ahead and vacuum the same room every day, right? The table gets moved, the chairs get moved. Sometimes you buy a new chair, okay? The, the, environment, is con the environment changes, okay? And that is, you know, um, I, so I feel like there's a communication difficulty in, in talking to roboticists. We say, oh, it doesn't really matter how many obstacles or where they are or this or that. If you had point robots, of course, if your robots, you know, were fat, if they, you know, if they were balls and finite size, that that's going to cause problems. But, you know, but if they're sufficiently small, it doesn't make a difference. But of course, what we've done is we've ignored the problem that they want, which is the flexibility. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the cost of flexibility. And this is sort of, as, as you can now see, this is the first variation on a theme. Okay, right? I mean, I want to talk about the problem of the Roomba when you move around the furniture, but we want to be dealing with the other things that we're not paying attention to as well, right? The fact that, you know, that robots have bounded resources of various kinds, okay? And, uh, and we want to be taking that into account. But at the moment, I just want to talk about uh, the cost of flexibility and the way we'll understand. So, um, so here, I'll just talk about one problem uh, from the paper. So, Okay, so I mean, should, should I set it up mathematically? I mean, uh, it feels like that's not. I mean, you could read the paper for the way we set it up, uh, but you know, uh, we're going to imagine that you have a parameter space, you have a family of problems. Okay, so in the Farber situation, okay, uh, the family of problems is really one space, and you're just in, interpreting it as two sections, namely an endpoint, an initial point, and an endpoint. But here we're imagining that you're having a whole family of problems, which you could think of either as being a vibration over a given space. In our situation, we were thinking about moving obstacles, which brings me to this solar system here, okay? Uh, right, where you have a whole bunch of different planets. So the robot, so in this, I'm going to imagine it's always the same section. So we're always going from zero to infinity, okay? Infinity is just someplace beyond Pluto or wherever the last planet is. I forget whether, you know, whether it's Pluto anymore, whatever, you, right, you have some finite number, right? And at the moment, I didn't talk about the, in, in our paper, we didn't talk about what happens if you would be adding a chair to the Roomba's problem, but then, you, you know, it wouldn't be hard to build that. But as we see, we'll see that when you have a finite number of chairs, the number of, cha the number of obstacles does increase the complexity. So in other words, being flexible is costly. Okay, and I'm viewing that as positive good news rather than bad news because it means that we're capturing something, you know, with this notion. Okay, I mean, the hope, of course, is that we'll also have unobvious theorems and that we will be able to tell them and say that, you know, 
you know, about what you could try to achieve using hardware versus software. But, you know, but that this problem that if you have, you know, right, so the analog of the thing about graphs, of course, when you remove a finite number of points from the plane, you get something homotopy equivalent to a graph. So the thing that I mentioned about graph would be that the complexity doesn't go up with the number of planets. That would be true if you were dealing with motionless planets. Okay, but if you are in a genuine solar system where the planets do move around, okay, and you're trying to get from you know zero to outside of the solar system, you you know you're trying to escape. Okay, we'll do a Star Wars scenario some other time. Okay, uh, so then you have a different kind of problem, and that will have growing complexity. Okay, so uh, in this case we have a parameter space that is a K torus, right? The isomorphism of you know a right. I have K different planets. And for each planet, I just look at the angle that goes from the planet to the, to the sun, to zero, and then out to infinity, okay? Okay, and now instead of Michael's situation where we're varying the sections, right? Where we're go get going from one a, a different point to another point, here I'm just gonna imagine once and for all going from the sun to outside of the solar system, okay? So now here's the point, right? And we're gonna be measuring the complexity, right? What I wanna know is, I wanna describe this as a union of UIs. These are gonna be regions in the parameter space. In other words, uh, you consult your astrologer about the positions of the stars, okay? the moving stars, right? Planets used to be just the moving stars, okay? So you, you, uh, you consult your astrologer and the divine astrologer will then tell you which, uh, which region you're in and then you'll do and then you'll follow him. Wow, I can't believe I've just given a topological argument in favor of astrology. Uh, I, I'm sure this talk will now go viral. Uh, okay, so suppose that I have such a, a U on which, um, on which I could continuously find a path, okay, uh, that, you know, where this, where the point avoids all of the, Right, as it, you know, so this is some kind of path P sub U of T, right? That goes from that goes from the sun to outside of the solar system, right? Suppose that I could do it. I mean, and it goes to you know near this point, you know, at infinity, right? This specific point at the end of the solar system. I don't want, I don't want its destination to be anywhere in the celestial sphere. Okay, it has a specific endpoint. So what would that mean? Well, I could go ahead and instead of making the, this function, I would make it zero sub P sub U of T, right? So at time zero, it starts off at being at, you know, the identification, it's the identity map from U to U. And as I go through this, after a while, right, at time equals one, right, then I'm, you know, very near infinity. Okay? I mean, you know, for all purposes, right? I'm at, I'm at this point outside of the solar system. Well, then all of the angles, right, I'm always in a left half plane. Right, so the angles are not going 360 degrees around, they're going up most 180 degrees around. So that would give me a homotopy. That gives me, right, so on each UI, right, a planner, is a null homotopy of the inclusion of UI into TK. Okay, so this very special case of the Roomba, right, where the Roomba is always starts off in the center of the room. You know, it only has furniture that a, each foot piece is consists of being on a particular circle, etc. Right, that very very special case. Then the parameterized complexity is exactly the luster nix neuroman category of the torus. Okay, so that category is k k plus one. I mean, I, I you know depends on your normalizations. Okay. Uh, Right, so this of course feels good because one knows that sectional com complexity is a generalization of lister nix neuroman So we, we've gone back, you know, we found a slightly different problem that we could handle by the most classical method. And of course, um, I want to advertise my paper uh, with Dan and Michael. Uh, there are actually two papers. Uh, they're both on they're both on the archive where we deal with, um, you know, the, you know, planets that aren't necessarily in an orbit. <laughs> Right, I mean, you know, they're not in separated orbits, and you know, we deal with the general configuration spaces, and it's a little different in odd dimensions and even dimensions. But the goal for all of this is to just is to just see, you know, you know, those are precise calculations. But overall, the impulse is to understand 
the, the cost of flexibility and to see that in topolo that topological complexity can embrace the fact that uh, certain kind that being flexible imposes costs. Okay, so uh, and are there any questions before I go further? Okay. Ah, I forgot about football. I was so excited about parameterized complexity and that I, was, that I forgot what I was supposed to be talking about, which is football. Okay, so now football is again a very similar situation to uh, the astrological problem. Okay, except that here, you know, you, you worry about the positions of the blockers uh, rather than the position of the planets. Uh, but as I pointed out, there, there, was a, there was a simplification from the mathematical point of view. Uh, that in the situation of the planets, you had a vibration, right? No matter which position, right? You know, topologically, all of the positions were the same, but in the situation of football, they are not, okay? Um, and for example, uh, you know, I could make the same parameter space, but if I did it with open, you know, then it would be trivial because all that the guy would do is he would do this and then run along the side zone, avoid all the blockers, right? No complexity at all. Right, I mean, it's precisely the fact that you, you know, that you've gone from open intervals to closed intervals that, you know, that oh, having a blocker here prevents that. Okay, you can't use that one. Right, it's precisely at the the point. Right, just like the Chebyshev polynomials, it's, I've identified where the vibration breaks, and that could be a cause of of complexity. It has to be because there's no other there's no topology in the configuration space. Okay, so we really, it has to be blamed somehow uh, on the, you know, on the lack of vibration. Okay, uh, so there is a theorem. Okay. Uh, it's K. Okay, that the amount of complexity to this is the number of blockers. Okay, you know, just like, just like in the solar system problem. Okay. So, um, you know, every talk should have a, a proof. And I forgot that I, you know, and I'm going to give you two proofs. So that makes it too technical a talk. And here's the proof of, uh, of topological football. Okay. It'll be proof reduction to astrology. My dean is an astronomer, and I can get in real trouble. Uh, if you contact her. Okay, so so let, so he, here's how the how it goes. I'm going to embed fo the football stadium into the solar system. Okay, so P. Okay, P is this k-dimensional cube. I could think of it as being inside of the k-dimensional torus. It's also a quotient of the k-dimensional torus. Okay. Uh, you know, the Z goes to Z bar, right? That involution on a torus, okay? I mean, uh, I guess you should reorient your soccer, your, your soccer field so that it's vertical instead of horizontal. But if you make Z goes to Z bar, right? That involution, right? The quotient map, well, everything is equivalent to a thing in the upper half space. And when I have K of them, right? Uh, you know, the points in the TK are identified uh, with, you know, right, the, the identification space for that, uh, for, for this projection, right, t, t to the k modulo z mod 2 to the k is in fact this k cube, okay, right? So we have the k cube, it's a fundamental domain uh, for this z mod 2 to the k action um, on the k torus, okay? And it's not at all a free action, right? I mean, it's this complicated Coxeter group uh, situation. Okay, not a complicated one, but it's you know more complicated than a free action. Okay, and now here's the proof, the point. Suppose that the top, I'm only going to show less than uh, equal to or greater than k. Okay, I'm not gonna, okay, I'm I'm not going to you know show that we realize it. I'm trying to show that football is harder the more people that block you, which by the way, you know, is a thing that football players do know. Okay. Uh, although they might not be having this model in mind. Okay, so, so now, suppose not. Suppose, for example, that the complexity were nothing, right? After all, this is contractible. It could have had no complexity at all, right? So what I claim is that if I have an, a motion planner 
for this problem, right, for the football problem, I could turn it into a motion planner for the, for the astrology problem. What would I do? I just would use, take the football motion planner associated to the projection of the astrological parameter. Okay, so of course, if I'm in the football field, I'm not changing anything, okay? Okay, right, I mean, you know, I'm just having the exact same problem. Now, if I have a solution to the football problem and I picked some other astrological problem, right? And now I'm saying, I want you to specifically just never go anywhere other than the football field. That's the only way, place I want you to run. Okay, you think you're, you know, you think you're a rocket ship. I want you to think you're a football player, right? Just do the football possibility, okay? And, you know, if I picked a point in the lower half plane, right? You know, something whose imaginary part was negative, okay? So then I'm creating a phantom blocker, which I will also avoid. I didn't need to avoid it, but I'll avoid the phantom blocker. I'm for sure not going to hit the blocker because the blocker isn't even in this cube, okay? So it's clear that the topological complexity of this football game is at least as large as the topological complexity um, of the astrological game, okay? So therefore, okay, I've now uh, actually proved the theorem about topological football, about robotic football, right? That the complexity does grow. And I you know, wanted to at least encourage uh, the, look, the looking at non-vibrations. Um, last month, uh, there was a, a, there's a nice paper that appears also talking about non-vibrations. And this is an, you know, this would, should be an example as you think about such theory. I think the typical result, for example, is that if you, right, which we topologists are always used to, is uh, you take a non-vibration, you turn it into a vibration, and then the actual uh, sectional complexity is going to be large, maybe larger than the one you get from vibrations and so on, right? So the topological theory certainly sheds light on the geometric theory, I would call it, okay? Uh, but they differ from each other. And I don't think we have yet, you know, in the ex enough examples, we should have some tools, we need to develop a vocabulary um, and, you know, uh, for figuring out what goes on in these kind of questions. I think that, uh, I think that the, uh, the implications of this will be further than just robotics. You know, just like, uh, as I pointed out, it occurs in numerical mathematics, you know, in the Bloom, Shoot, Smell, Cooker program. Okay. So now I want to go back. Okay. I'm going back to the, to, and, you know, it turns out if you ask a football player and you say, how hard is it to get, you know, to the other end zone? And you tell them that the complexity is higher uh, because, you know, when you have more blockers, he'll agree with you. But if you say that those blockers don't get to move, right? What happens is you have a snap, you know, you take a snapshot, okay? And the blockers don't move, then they don't think it's a hard problem. I mean, I don't know, it's really strange. We know that it creates instabilities and that's a hard problem, right? But what happens, you know, but the motion of the blockers are irrelevant. Now, why is that? Okay, why is the motion? Well, it's because the space, right? Uh, you know, moving blockers, is, you know, the space of phi one through phi k mapping zero one into your space, such that phi i of t is never equal to phi j of t, right? The, the blockers aren't allowed to, you know, hit each other, okay? And, right, so this is, you know, this is, you know, it's some kind of, you know, it's the, path, you know, you could think of it as being the path space of the configuration space of k distinct points in X. Okay, and when you think about it, space is, right? So this space is, of course, everyone knows who knows what the words mean. Well, everyone after Sarah who knows what the words mean knows that this is homotopy equivalent, right? This is the basic maneuver I was mentioning. We turn non-vibrations into vibrations, right? The standard way for doing that is you have a map from A to B, and you would look at the space of, you know, uh, you know, things of the function, things of the form A and, a, and a, a path in B, right, such that 
you know, f of zero equals pi of a, right? And, you know, right? I mean, you know, you go ahead and you, you, you know, I mean, you, you go ahead and you build some other space mapping on, right? We, we, we replace spaces by homotopy equivalent spaces, which I point out as violence in this game, right? And, you know, this kind of path space of the configuration space, right? It's literally just turning something or other into a, turning an inclusion map into a vibration, right? It might be a, a completely, you know, feels like a benign step. Okay, but in fact, right, that's throwing away the problem that, you know, a, a practical football player deals with, which is the fact that, uh, it deals with the fact that you can't assume that the blockers um, are motionless. Okay, so now, by the way, so what we have a theorem that even though we have this infinite dimensional space, uh, this infinite dimensional space, right, of moving blockers, we say that this omniscient, omnipotent, robot could avoid those blockers to the exact same extent as he could if they were motionless. Okay, what's the meaning of that theorem? Okay, that is a theorem. That's right. That's again, one of these non-trivial results, right? But I just gave you a lot of, uh, I insisted that you make this robot really omniscient, omnipotent, et cetera, right? Uh, what, what happens when you unpack it? Well, here's the point, right? It's supposed to be that at time zero, Right, the robot looks at his problem, looks at it at the field. In other words, he's read the mind, he has a spy, he's spoken to the other coach. He knows how these other robots, right, these other blockers are going to be moving and that they're allegedly not responding to him in any way, right? They've been given deterministic paths, okay? It's not, right, I mean, so he knows the whole future and furthermore, there's no conditions on him. He's allowed to pick any path he wants. So what he could do is he could decide he's going to go, you know, 5,000 times the, the maximum speed of any of these blockers so that for all practical purposes, they're in balls of size epsilon. Balls of size epsilon are just as good as points. And then he just goes ahead and, ignore, and pay attention to them as points, right? So the reason that you're able, right? So here, vibration is a way of building in omnipotence. Okay, it's, it's, it's saying that you know the future, okay, which I think is really bad. I mean, as a hypothesis, it also says that you have much greater speed than the other one. I'm not going to worry about that so much, although that's also an interesting problem, you know, that, you know, Michael and I are having conversations about, right? But, you know, the fact that, right, I mean, it should be that your path, it's a much more complicated thing to model, right? But you want to take into account that you might not know the whole future, right? That you might be responding to what the other one does. Okay, it's a way, way more complicated problem that is uh, being ignored by this. Okay, now of course, you know, uh, if you, if by the way, speed bounds could also take into account your lack of intelligence. Okay, that's I think I don't want to say anything about the way football is played in the past. People usually don't have access to what the plays are going to be. They don't know the future. But if the quarterback is a lot faster than any of the blockers, then the, the argument that I said didn't require you to know the note where the blocker was, right? You knew that it was gonna be in a ball of radius epsilon. So speed in that case will trump the lack of sensing. But in general, you would wanna be building a more complicated model uh, that would be taking that into account, okay? So, okay, so I think I've already told you what's on this slide. What's hidden in the vibration hypothesis, right? So what's hidden in the vibration hypothesis is, I, is Right, the fact that there's no sense, right? That it isn't that you know what, you know, that you know the position of the robot, of the obstacles at time t because you're sensing them. And that, right, you're instead assuming that you're able to, you know, if you like, I, it's assuming here, Claire, you know, um, what it, what's that thing when you can see the future? I forget, it's not clairvoyance, but it's, well, whatever, it, you know, it, it, it requires prophecy. Right, that at time zero, when you just sense the playing field, right, you're imagining you know the whole future motions of all the robots, of all the blockers. Which, by the way, I mean, I, there are cool movies where that happens. You know, you go through life once and you go through a time loop and then you know exactly where it's going to be the next time. Very, very cool movies, you know, actually seeing those motion planners. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's not a dumb problem, but it, it's, it's not maybe the, the only one that you want to model. Okay, um, I want to comment that this thing, as I told you, that, you know, uh, the issue of speed here is very related to the issue of hard balls. If you were, you know, in other robotic problems, which we, by the way, haven't really, there's lots and lots of things done in configuration space. There are theorems that if you know that the, that the particles are balls instead of just points, and the balls are sufficiently small 
in terms of the number of particles and the geometry of the space, then the configuration space of hard balls is homotopy equivalent to the configuration space of points, right? There's a threshold thing. What happens when you go beyond the threshold? I think it's a fascinating kind of problem. It has, it has some of the similarities to you know, this kind of problem involving, say, speed or clairvoyance. Um, and again, I kind of recommend that this should be something that we study just sort of at the border, okay, of it, okay. <coughs> um, I'm running a little bit out, of, I'm running out of time, which uh, isn't shocking because I didn't model time into as one of the uh, factors of our robot, right? We always make it in functions from the interval zero, one. <laughs> you know, we don't have time as one of our parameters. Uh, but I want to point out that there are sort of lots of other things that one could uh, be concerned about uh, in doing this. Um, and uh, let me, so there are a few different possibilities. I mean, one might be, you know, your robot might be instead of, you know, I mean, I already mentioned hard balls, but I mean, it could also be, you know, you might want to call this a softball. Okay, I'm not talking about playing softball now. Okay, yeah, I mean, softballs are hard. Okay, right. I mean, right. I mean, what about if your robot, right? We talk about hard balls, right? And you know, the work that I mentioned before, where they're not vibration. What about soft balls? Okay, that leads us to different questions. Okay, um, and. Uh, another thing that I was going to mention is if you have, if you want to be imagining the motion of DNA, right? It's not you don't think of it as a robot, but DNA, you know, strings of things have to move around, okay? Or you might have multiple agents, but then the agents say interact with each other, right? So that I always need to be at most a certain distance from my, my two neighbors, and you know and so on and so forth, right? There could be some kind of uh, additional graphical structure that you want to preserve. And all of these lead to other mathematical problems uh, that I would like to encourage uh, the community to pay some attention to. So he, this is a, a, a paper which I, I don't think people in this community are aware of. Um, and it's very relevant to the case. Uh, so this appeared in uh, communication, CPAM, Communications in Pure and Applied Math, the Courant House Journal. Uh, and um, I, oh, I was gonna say, I don't remember when, but I don't have to remember. It's down at the bottom, it's in 1995. Uh, and this was based on Alex's thesis. And here's the remarkable th thing that he said, suppose that I, you know, right? So then the analog would be, right? So here I have something or other, it's abstractly a ball, right? It, it's a blob. I'm, I'm moving a Mobius, you know, what, what's it called? An amoeba, an amoeba robot. And it has to move, you know, and not only does it have, you know, a point, the final configuration might be, you know, more ball-like or it might be, you know, weird like that, right? You know, right, I mean, it has, you know, right, the configurations of an amoeba are very, very complicated. And the question is, how does, now you might say, well, hey man, a ball is a ball, right? This thing should not be very, very hard. We know that any two balls in a manifold are isotopic in a connected manifold or isotopic, right? You know, and we're not, we're having unparametrized amoebas, okay? So don't tell me about the orientation or anything like that, you know, right? There's really, you know, you're just, you know, you're, you're dealing with a trivial prop, you know, at least a problem of moving an amoeba from one position to another should be a trivial problem uh, if you're not careful. Uh, in, you know, if you just go ahead and, you know, ask about existence and things like that. So what Alex said is this, he will measure the complexity. So we're going to, I'm going to work in a compact manifold. He works entirely within a ball. So his amoeba was just moving inside of a, of a just a large ball. But, you know, uh, and the, the, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit on the definitions, but it, it's still so beautiful that I want to talk about it. Okay. And you ask the following, we'll say the complexity of an amoeba is, well, you have an amoeba, so then on its, you know, on its uh, cell wall, right, it has normals to that wall. And those normals for a little while, they don't intersect each other, but when they get to a certain size then they begin intersecting each other. So take one over the size, and that's uh, what I think he calls the, the, the new crumpledness, okay? He looks at it in both directions, but it doesn't matter, but we'll just look at it on the outside, okay? And now you ask, and you'll use this crumpledness for being how complicated the state of the amoeba is. And now you ask whether I want to move an amoeba to an, one amoeba to another amoeba. And I ask, does the crumpledness have to go up? B, 
big, right? It obviously has to be at least as big as the most crumpled of the two of them at some point, either at the beginning or at the end. The question is, can you make it less? Okay. Um, and the answer is the greedy algorithm doesn't work. You can't just decrease crumpledness, you know? Uh, so the question is, so therefore you have to increase it. So now how much do you have to increase it? Is it an exponential? Is it a tower of exponentials where the number of sides of the tower is the dimension of the manifold? Is it worse than that? Okay. Is it really easy? Well, the, there's a theorem here which says that in dimension, if you're inside a six manifold or higher, okay, so it doesn't have immediate applications, right? Uh, the, the, the amount that the crumpleness goes up, goes up is greater than any computable function. Okay, you give me a, a computable function like a tower of exponentials where the size of the tower is a tower of exponentials in the dimension. No, that's not enough uh, for crumpled amoebas. Okay, it's a really, really remarkable theorem. I mean, uh, I wrote a book about this called, uh, what did I say? Computers, Rigidity and Moduli, uh, where I try to turn this result into a philosophy. Uh, but it's, I think it's an important result, right? It, it says that, right, that if you were dealing with this configuration space, the fact that you have to make it more crumpled, that means that the process is irreduce, you know, it's irreducibly complicated, right? I mean, it's a different, right? And that kind of complexity can be really uh, super duper, okay? Um, I have three more minutes. Um, I think that I will, uh, rather than going further, uh, just delete the rest of the talk since I think that I will just be sputtering if I uh, speak anymore. But in any case, I just wanna say that there are lots of different kinds of motion planners. Moving around things are sometimes homotopies. They're sometimes isotopies. Uh, some of these things, there's the theory of uh, the Goodwillie Klein Weiss calculus of embeddings that reduces, that says that many problems um, in embedding theory, um, the Smale theory of emergence is also the same way, gets reduced to problems involving either configuration spaces or homotopy of spaces of sections. These are exactly the kinds of problems that have already been occurring in topological robotics. There are problems that are introduced because of singularities, uh, compatibility conditions, uh, various things are, instead of being just maps from one space to another, it's, you know, uh, spaces of maps in a category of diagrams, I mean, you know, all of these kind of things. So there's technically complicated mathematics. There are also, I think, nice stories we can tell that will lead to some of these problems being interesting. Uh, so, uh, that's what I'm going to close with, uh, you know, just that there are a, ho a host of problems of this sort that if you muse about topological football um, and, its, uh, out, um, and its outgrowth, you're led into. And that basically the idea would be that in other places where you study function spaces, you don't just look at the function space themselves. I, the, what gets suggested is to look at a natural functional on the function space, like say the Lipschitz constant of a map. And then instead of looking at the homology or the cohomology or other invariants like we're used to, you would look at the persistent homology of that function space with respect to such a functional. And then that will be also a way in which you can begin talking to your colleagues uh, from the other seminar. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's all I will say for now. Thank you, Shmuel. Let's open it up for questions now. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. I prepared a blank page for answers. <laughs> if we need it. If and only if we need it. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I have a question. This is a desire. Oh, I... Yeah. Uh, the theory, quite fascinating to an old differential topologist like myself, has this actually been used by people with robots to help them that they got them something extra, or is it still an exercise in pure mathematics? Um, Can't hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, oh, yeah, oh, no. Uh, oh, my advisor told me that uh, that when someone asks a question, you should pause and think before answering. Okay. And, you know, and uh, that's what I was uh, trying to do. 
Uh, so the answer is both yes and no. Okay. Uh, you know, for example, if you were, so there are this specific set of tools, I'm not aware of roboticists using. Uh, the spirit of topology. So for example, there are other problems of this sort that I haven't discussed, like the use of navigating functions um, or Morse theory. Uh, lots of talk, right? I mean, the theorem about Luster and Schirrelman category, right? I mean, it gives you, it, you know, you can interpret in terms of numbers of critical points and you do a reinterpretation of that sort. And indeed, like Dan Kodacek is, you know, has constantly been searching for explicit Morse functions to build into his robots to achieve various kinds of goals. So I would say that it's very, that it's more the spirit of the theorems and their ideas that so far have been useful to some set of roboticists in then doing robotics, which, and of course, you know, I mean, the philosophers of science discuss the, you know, the context of discovery versus the context of justification. So, you know, these ideas might enter in the discovery process of which kind of problems are likely to be easy, which kind of things are hard, what are the issues that you have to worry about. Uh, but then in the context of justification, you build a robot and it justifies itself. You don't have to say, oh, well, I was using a Morse function or, you know, or anything else, right? You know, so I, I'm not aware of anyone in our community uh, having gotten a patent uh, as a result of any of this. Uh, but I think that some of this, you know, some of the ideas that underlie this way of thinking you know, have been useful. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and I want to say that, you know, part of, you know, I mean, one thing that I'm hoping in this, you know, I, when I started this talk, I said that I'm not really in the real world. I've gone back to the armchair. Okay. And of course, if you think about it, that's exactly what I did. I said, what is the problem of the robot? And, you know, I just imagined, you know, I, I, there were moments when I imagined myself to be a robot, right? But it isn't the case that I actually went and spoke to roboticists and asked them, what are their problems? Okay, and I think that that is a stage in this. I think that we do have to become engaged. We have to find, you know, I don't think that, you know, your every roboticist is going to give us problems. You know, a lot of them are going to be telling us, oh, I want to know how to navigate on a specific tree, which you said is trivial, etc. And we might have things to learn from them, in, you know, in terms of our modeling, we might go ahead and build you know, some configure, you know, some art and group associated to the tree and measure something there. And it says, you know, and we might have something to say after a long time, but it, I think it's a longer and more complicated process. You know, so I am looking forward. I think that after we take, you know, you know, write a few papers from the armchair, we'll be able to go back to the roboticists and say, oh, well, we've been thinking about other aspects now. Now do we, now, you know, now can you give us a set of problems that maybe we could help you or maybe we can help you now. Okay, thank you very much. By the way, if I said anything controversial, I would love to hear the rebuttal. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I, because I, you know, I, this kind of philosophy of how to go ahead uh, in doing math and science, I, I don't feel like I have any kind of uh, monopoly on. I mean, it's just a, my my personal perspective. Are there further questions? If not, let's thank Shmuel again and I will stop the recording. If anything else comes up, please feel free to chime in.